Hello, everybody. Oh, come on, you guys can say hello back. <laughs> so I wanted to start just a couple minutes early because um, since, you know, there's the word boat in the title and these events are kind of like going on a journey, I wanted everyone to just take a minute to introduce yourself to your neighbors. So please say hello to somebody you don't know. Okay, now that everybody knows everybody, it's better to travel with friends than strangers. So welcome, my name's Meg Linton. I'm the CEO of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation and we're really pleased to present The Library Live with author Helen Zia. Um, if you attend our programs regularly, um, you will often hear me say that it takes a village to put our lectures together and tonight is no exception. We want to thank our board member Nancy Dolfers and her team of volunteers who spend, this, who spend the year researching and selecting our library live speakers. So Nancy, stand up and could the committee stand up? <laughs> Lauren. There's Lauren and Toby here too. Um, yeah, really, it, it's our volunteers that really help us put all these programs together, so it's wonderful. Uh, I also want to recognize um, Kungo Wangmo and her attention to every little detail and her patience. So Kunga's in the back. And to make this a fabulous evening for all who are here and for all of those who will be watching this on video or listening to the podcast, please silence your cell phones now. And please get them out of your pockets and double check uh, because there's nothing like having a scowling author staring you down from the podium. A few other housekeeping matters um, in case of emergency. There's three exits. There's one there, there in the back, my flight attendant skills. Um, and the restrooms are just down the hallway in the back. A um, couple questions for you. How many of you know about the proposed library lecture hall? Yay! Um, <laughs> uh, if you would like more info, please ask Jill Johnson Tucker. Stand up. She's got all the details. She is a dedicated community member who's serving on the lecture hall design committee and is really making things happen. I also wanted to point out Barbara Gladman, who's one of our library trustees. So she volunteers and helps take care of the library. Thank you for your service. Um, and how many of you are foundation members? Awesome, this is wonderful. Um, I wanna thank you for your part in making all of this programming possible and for supporting the library. If you aren't a member and you'd like to receive advance notice on programs, discount on tickets, and have that feel-good feeling for supporting your local library and free access to knowledge, please see our board chair, Kathy Verreyer, who can stand up so everyone can see you. Another one of our dedicated volunteers. Um, and also, I would just want to call out how many of our Library Live sponsors are here this evening? There should be quite a few. Yeah. So um, I want to thank you and also some, uh, Natasha and Todd Palmer and Sam and Tammy Tang for your generous sponsorship of the 2019-2020 Library Live season. Um, all of our sponsors are listed on the rack cards and on our website, and um, we really can't do our programs without you. So you make the foundation's mission to support the library with valuable resources and programs possible. We appreciate you going above and beyond your membership to bring intelligent and ta talented people like Helen Zia to our community. So tonight, we're gathered here to listen to Helen share her 12 years of research about an untold exodus in her latest book, The Last Boat Out of Shanghai, the epic story of the Chinese who fled Mao's revolution. The book is a finalist for the 2020 National Pen American Book Award in biography, and the winners will be announced on March 2nd. So everyone cross your fingers and toes for Helen. To introduce Helen this evening, we have Professor Jeffrey Wasserstrom from UC Irvine, who's a specialist in modern Chinese history. He's the author of Student Protests in the 20th Century China, The View from Shanghai, Global Shanghai, 1850 to 2010, and China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, which he co-authored with uh, Maura Cunningham, and it's now in its third edition. 
Jeffrey also wrote a thoughtful review of The Last Boat out of Shanghai for the Wall Street Journal. And if you haven't read his review, I, I encourage you to do so. So please welcome Jeffrey. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. It's always a pleasure to be back here. I've had the great pleasure to introduce two speakers before this. First, I got to introduce a very talented uh, journalist who became a popular historian, John Meacham. <laughs> then I got to introduce a feminist um, journalist who writes hard-hitting things on, on activist causes, Masha Gessen. Now I get to introduce a in, uh, journalist who's become a very talented popular historian and also has been a hard-hitting feminist activist <laughs> journalist. So two for the price of one tonight. <laughs> It's, um, it's really a pleasure. I, I, I read this book when it was out in hardcover. I'm delighted to see it's now out in paperback. I'm sort of delighted. I'll tell you why I'm only sort of delighted in a minute. I'm delighted that it, it's such a good book. I have no qualms about that. But I happened to write a book that just came out, Vigil, Hong Kong on the Brink, that's about Hong Kong. And when I was looking at the Amazon page, it was number one new release in Hong Kong history. I thought, OK, at least I've got that niche. Then it got bumped. It was number two in Hong Kong history. Number one was the paperback edition of Helen's book, <laughs> which isn't even about Hong Kong. But some of the people who took the last boat out of Shanghai went to Hong Kong. And in fact, as I moved from Shanghai history to Hong Kong history, the connections between the two places have been very, very clear. And that's one of the many, many things about this book. It's about Shanghai, last boat, but it's also about the places that people ended up, including America, at a time when people encountered a kind of discrimination in various ways that resonates with the present. It's a, very, it's a book that's been described aptly as one that's about the past but speaks to contemporary um, issues in many ways. You'll learn about Taiwan in it, if you haven't read it already, at a very interesting time in the 1950s there. So it becomes, in some ways, a book about Shanghai in the 1940s but also the world in the early 1950s. So you get things there. It also resonates with me. It, right now, sh in Hong Kong, some people are saying, should we stay or should we go? How much longer will this very unusual cosmopolitan city that's been absorbed and, and maybe completely absorbed by a Communist Party-run state, can we live the kind of life that we've, we've grown, grown used to? Those are exactly the same kinds of questions that um, the characters in Helen's book we're asking in the 1940s, so it resonates there. So it's very fitting that Helen and I had never met before about two weeks ago. We met two weeks ago when she um, moderated beautifully a book talk for me <laughs> in San Francisco at the Commonwealth Club, which was a wonderful experience. Um, I realize I'm making this presentation as much about me as about her, <laughs> but I'll stick with that theme and say, if you think about what historians, academic historians are supposed to be like and what journalists are supposed to be like, academic historians are supposed to spend a long time on their books and doing research. Helen spent um, 12 years on her last book. I spent 12 months. Uh, academic historians are supposed to write, you know, big books, big books. I'll just show you because I can't resist it. This is my book. <laughs> So if you had to guess which of us was the journalist and which of us was the historian, you would guess that, it, um, that maybe you would guess reversed. And sometimes people guard the borders of that, but I think there are all kinds of reasons for many kinds of borders um, like that one to be porous and to accept the idea that if people are doing really good work on the other side of it, we should welcome them and claim them rather than try to guard um, against them. And so I'm very happy to think of Helen um, with this book as firmly being a historian and, um, and a very um, elegant historian of that. I, I wrote down some of the quotes from other people's reviews and you can, you can see them on there. They're great. She has an enviable number. There were 890 people, I think, late, who had rated her on Goodreads yeah. by now and it was 4.5 um, out of a, a average out of five. And it was gripping read, must read, you should read it. And on the back of the book, you'll see quotes like, eye-opening by People Magazine, 
And Zia lets us eavesdrop on the conversations in hushed voices of several people whose childhoods are brought, to vivid, brought vividly to life. Last Boat Out of Shanghai is an engaging work of high quality popular history. That sounds like a really um, good way of summing it up. That's what I wrote for the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> so um, thank you and please join me in welcoming <laughs> Helen Zia. Jeff, thank you so much. Nice. Jeff can take that big step. I'm coming over here. <laughs> thank you, Jeff, for such a generous and wonderful introduction. Um, we become kind of a tag team now because I was able to have play the opposite role with him in San Francisco. And and if you haven't read his book, Hon um, Vigil Hong Kong on the uh, on the Brink, I recommend it highly to um, sort of carry forward uh, something I wrote about of an exodus 70 years ago, 71 years ago now, but um, you know, it follows a similar trajectory. So thank you to the um, Newport Beach Library Foundation, the Newport Beach Public Library. I love libraries. Um, and there's nothing more than an author can want than to be in a room of enthusiastic people in a public library. So thank you, Megan, for um, all of you who work so hard to make this uh, such a vital part of your community. Um, so this book, Last Boat Out of Shanghai, I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about how it came to be, um, some of the background and things that I discovered along the way. Even though, as Jeff points out, it's a kind of a thick book. And uh, in talking to some of you, I heard that it was a little intimidating to pick up at first. I know it's a fat book. And in, it, actually, I had to cut out a lot of it because it, you know, most publishers don't want to publish a big fat book. Um, and so there's a, a lot of stories that actually did not make it into the book. Um, it's a nonfiction book. It's real people real events, real places, and I tried as hard as I could to make it faithful to the streets of Shanghai. I spent uh, a lot of time in Shanghai. I have probably read and uh, uh, every book I could find about it, including popular books of the period that I was looking at, so that I could know what kind of curtains did they use, what kind of furniture, what, who were the Art Deco architects, um, what did the city look like, how did it feel? And so to me, the places were as much a character in the book as the people. Um, I had wonderful reviews, as, as Jeff pointed out, and, and, but I did have one from, uh, from Hong Kong, the South China Morning Post online edition, that said, well, this book wasn't that good because it's not such a good novel. And I wrote immediately, and I said, you are right. It is not such a good mo novel. In fact, it's not a novel at all. I hope you'll reread it and, and uh, consider rewriting your thing, which they did not. Um, so, so anyway, so what I want to do is also read some passages. Um, let me ask how many of you have read this book already? A number of you. It looks like about half. And, and uh, I don't want to have too many spoilers, um, but you know, there's been a lot of things written about it already, so you might already know some of the spoiler things. And um, how many of you have been to Shanghai? Oh, even more. And beyond Shanghai to China. <laughs> I get almost everybody in the room, all right. So you will recognize a lot of the locations and, and so forth. And, and as you read the book or as you've read the book, I hope you can also imagine the streets, the places. Um, many of the incidents happen right either on the Bund, right by People's Square, through the former French concession, uh, through the former international settlement and beyond um, very uh, noted landmarks in Shanghai. And so, um, so let me start with where did this idea come from? I had been a journalist for a, uh, a long time, and uh, through most of my writing, it had focused on, you know, as a journalist, uh, things about America, American culture, communities, things like that. I was a magazine writer, uh, politics, um, and through most of my uh, magazine writing, a, a, as a journalist, I had really not written much about Asian Americans or things related to, uh, let alone China. And 
um, when it came time to write, when I really felt like I wanted to tell the stories that I had not seen before, I wrote stories about Asians in America. And so this book is a little bit of a departure for me because the focus is about China. And so why did I get drawn to this exodus that happened in uh, the 1949 period? And I say 1949 period because it really began around 1947 and continued for a number of years after the revolution took place in 1949. And so there wasn't a lot I knew about my, my parents' stories. Um, my parents were immigrants from China. Uh, they, my father came in the 1940s. My mother came to America in 1949. And the only thing I knew as a kid growing up was what my mother and my aunt would say, we made it out of China on the last boat out of Shanghai. And they would always say it in that tone, you know, mystery, doom. and. As a kid, I didn't really know what that meant. Oh, you came on the last boat instead of the last truck or something. And, um, and as I grew more curious about that, because you know, as a kid growing up in New Jersey in the 50s and 60s, there weren't a lot of Chinese in communities outside of Chinatown. And uh, I would be told on a regular basis, go back where you came from. And I would have to say, New Jersey? You know, um, actually, I no longer live in New Jersey, and I really don't want to go back there, but um, <laughs> anybody else here from New Jersey? <laughs> ah, I always have. <laughs> and I love meeting people who aren't ashamed to say they're from New Jersey, so <laughs> thank you. Um, but so the other thing that would happen is because I felt like, well, do I really belong in this country? They want me to go back to a place that I've never been. Maybe I belong there and I should find out about it. And so I would ask my mother, like any kid, um, gee, mom, what was it like for you growing up in China? And she would say, without skipping a beat, that was wartime, a bad memory. And that would be it. And so end of story. And periodically, I would pop, pipe up again and just say, um, mom, what can you tell me about my grandparents, your mother and father? That was wartime, a bad memory. So I kind of, you know, as I got older, I stopped asking. I just thought there's nothing to tell there. And um, so then one day when my mother was in her 70s and I was in my 50s, I had already, you know, had a career as a journalist. I'd already written a couple of books. And I was having dinner with my mother and uh, wanted to change the subject. I didn't want to talk about her aches and pains and things like that that evening at dinner. And I just said, oh, gee, mom, too bad you can't tell me about your uh, growing up in China. And you know, it wasn't even a question. It was just like, oh, too bad. She put down her chopsticks and she said, all right, you want to know, I'll tell you. And you can imagine, I was just shocked. And I sat there trying to act like nothing had happened because I didn't want to break the spell. And my mother began to tell me a story. So I, I want to begin with um, a little bit about that story. And so there's a little girl in this book. Her name's Little, little Sister. She, as a child, didn't have another name. It was just Little Sister. And her father, Baba, announced that he was going to take her on a special trip. And so, you know, this is a poor family in the countryside. There were no special trips. And being able to go somewhere with her father and uh, not one of her two brothers, it was, she was so excited. And so, um, so she went on a train with her Baba to Suzhou. She remembered every moment of that journey, for she had been giddy that Baba had chosen her, not one of her brothers. She sat on her father's lap, her eyes glued to the window, mesmerized by the neat rice fields and towns, just like hers, sweeping by in a blur. When they arrived in Suzhou, she was surprised at how much bigger and busier it was than quiet Changzhou. Men and women dressed in fine silk fabrics and even foreign outfits, so unlike her mother and father who wore roughly woven traditional dress. When they... Um, uh, when they reached the train station, Baba flagged down the driver of a wooden moon-wheeled cart. 
She, flung, she clung to her father's arm while perched on the rough-hewn plank alongside the wooden wheel. The gnarly driver weaved his way through the maze-like streets and lanes. After a twisty, bumpy ride over arched stone bridges and canals lined by weeping willows, they finally came to a stop at a small store. Inside, her father spoke to the shopkeepers in a low voice while she stood waiting by the door, looking out at the parade of vendors on the street. There was so much more to see here than in her town. Soon Baba called for her and told her to stand still beside him. The shopkeepers looked into her mouth and squeezed her little arms. When they finished poking and prodding, one of them took her hand and led her to another room. As she turned to look for her father, she saw his back as he headed out the door. Baba, Baba, she cried. He didn't turn around. Baba, come back. How could he leave without her? The stranger gently pushed her into a small dark storeroom and locked the door. Alone and terrified of what might lurk in the darkness, at first she could only whimper. Then she steeled herself and called for her father as hard as she could until she grew hoarse and couldn't shout anymore. Exhausted, she sobbed herself to sleep. When the little girl awakened on the musty dirt floor, she thought she had had a terrible nightmare. But when she tried to open the door, it wouldn't budge. She could see the glare of daylight around the cracks. Once again, she screamed for her father. Baba never came. So this was the story that I heard that night after my mother said, you want to know, I'll tell you. And it continued on and on for hours that evening, and I sat as quietly as I could. Um, there was one moment where uh, my mother stopped for air, and I didn't really know what to say. I was speechless. And uh, something equally clever popped into my head, and I said, gee, mom, you have such a good memory. <laughs> and my mother looked at me and she said, I was six years old. I remember every detail. It was the worst day of my life. And so her memory was incredible. And, um, you know, I, I think I went for a while with my head just spinning. My world had gone totally upside down because we all grow up with a narrative of our families, where our families came from, the things that they teach us. And, and then you find out suddenly that, wow, it isn't anything like I thought. And my mother has this whole life that I had no idea. And so, um, so but I was also a journalist. So every time I saw my mother after that, I had a million questions for her. And at some point, I realized I kind of put together this last boat out of Shanghai and wondered how was it my mother after such a hard beginning in life ended up on the last boat out of Shanghai to land in America and to have a whole different life and, um, and to keep this a secret for more than 70 years. And so I started to wonder, um, you know, this was really a whole generation. What were the experiences of people like my mother? Um, what were their stories? What about all those people who I would run into who would say, oh, my family was on the last boat out of Shanghai, and, and I began to realize there was no boat large enough for all the people who said their families were on the last boat, or the last plane, or the last train, but the one thing they had in common was they had escaped something so bad that they had to leave the city that they loved, the place where their extended families were. Some of them left um, children behind, elderly parents, uh, everything they owned, um, and they left. And so I began to wonder what that was, and it stuck with me for a long time. And, um, and so with this story that I learned, I. I I began to think somebody should write about this. And I, and I have to say, I didn't think I was the perfect person. I'm an ABC, an American-born Chinese. At the time that I was a child growing up, uh, the McCarthy inquisitions were going on. It was an incredibly uh, the, um, um, Cold War, the anti-communist um, you know, inquisitions, the anti-China stuff. And my father said to my mother when we were small children, 
don't speak Chinese to the children. So we grew up as monolingual Americans, and, uh, and I have to say how much I regret that my father ever said that to my mother, um, because by the time I was in college, I really wanted to know more. I took some Chinese, Mandarin, and not enough to become fluent. Um, so I didn't really think I was the right person, and if I had to design the person, it would have been somebody like Jeffrey or, um, or his students, and I have to, his graduate students. And I have to say, I did spend quite a number of years talking to every professor I knew to say, do you have some graduate students who speak Chinese who, who, and maybe speak Shanghainese? This is a generation. Time is not on their side. We have to begin capturing their stories because uh, until this book came out, there is not a single book in the English language about the Chinese exodus of that time, not a single dissertation that I know of. Um, and in fact, there are only about three or four books in Chinese written in Taiwan about the exodus to Taiwan. And the thing about an exodus and the diaspora that comes out of it, people flee everywhere. Everywhere, anywhere, they can go and think that they can find a safe haven. So um, um, at least a million went to Hong Kong in 1949 alone, and many more uh, in the years following. Not all from Shanghai. Um, two million, approximately, ended up in Taiwan in that period. More to come later. And so that was just, you know, you could say three or four million or plus right there, not all from Shanghai, but many were from Shanghai, and, um, and millions of others that are uncounted at this point. So I, I really wanted to kind of get the story of the scope of this. But because there wasn't a, a lot of other research about it, a lot of my first work as um, a journalist interested in history was to try to understand, you know, how many? I mean, that was a question, and I could only um, extrapolate. I mean, I actually spent a lot of time trying to find that out. And at my estimate, it's at least a million who were from Shanghai or passed through Shanghai. So that covers a lot of bases. Shanghai was one of the major port cities of the world. I mean, it ranked with London, Paris, um, New York, and Berlin, and Shanghai. And so it was one of the top cities of the world. Everybody who had any interest in Asia or global affairs went there. Albert Einstein, George Bernard Shaw, um, W.H. Uh, Auden, Charlie Chaplin, and the list goes on of people who went to Shanghai to understand you know, the, the times and how that was affecting the other side of the globe. Um, so I made that rough estimate I think it could have been more, who knows. The thing was that Shanghai was a city of about six million people at the time, only, second in population only to New York um, in the world. And so, um, so I did, I, if anybody's interested, I can tell you the nerd part of how I extrapolated about a million. But the other part, the other challenge was trying to find other people's stories. So it's not like there was a list. I couldn't go to an archive and find, um, you know, names, addresses, numbers, or anything like that. So I began doing what a journalist does, and I put the word out. I started talking to actually random strangers, you know, that I would run into, and we'd strike up a conversation. They might ask what I was doing. I might ask, you know, and, and it might come up that they had been to Shanghai. Maybe their families were from Shanghai. And in that case, I would just say, well, do you think anybody of these people you might know would be willing to talk to me? And so um, the average age of the people I interviewed was probably, uh, the range was late 60s to 90s. And um, you know we're talking about a World War II generation. I was doing this uh, research about 10, 15 years ago. And so I soon discovered that if they were in their 60s, they would have been children at the time of 1949. And their memories were children's memories. So, oh, you know, their parents were making the hard decisions. They were just kind of along for the ride. And many of them were saying things like, well, it wasn't so bad. We got to play all the time because there was no school to go to. Or, um, and the individuals in their 90s after interviewing for maybe you know a half an hour, it 
soon became clear that the conversation would veer off into some very strange territory. And then I had to question um, everything that he, they had already told me and how, how much, how, how their memories were working then. So my average age for more than 100 people was about 80. 80 years old would have meant that they were in their early 20s at the time of this 1949-ish exodus. And so, um, so that meant they were young adults. They had young adult memories, but they had adult impressions and observations. And so, um, so my search then became one of geography. Where did they leave from? Where did they live? What was their family background? Um, how did they get wherever they were going? Uh, when did they leave? What month? How? On the last boat? You know, many of them left on the last boat, by the way, <laughs> all different boats. But, um, and, and so I began to, to call people up. I mean, calling people up about a time in their life, like my mother's, that was really trauma. They had lived through terrible things. Most of them had, um, in Shanghai, when, when, well, so my book begins, <laughs> Uh, in 1937, not in 1949. So I trace, I, I found out of this hundred, I, I picked four, and we can talk about how I chose those four, but uh, I picked four, and so I started uh, tracing their lives from childhood before they were 20 and made this exodus. And, um, and where was I going with that? But. <laughs> But so uh, you'll find that in, in this book is, is, is as much about the, the history and formation of Shanghai and especially the look that was, um, you know, portrayed in these photographs, you know, a period of time when uh, chi uh, Shanghai was experiencing war and occupation. So I know where I was going with that. The, you know, I started with the um, Battle of Shanghai on, uh, in August, August uh, 12th and 13th of uh, 1937. Most of us in America think of uh, World War II beginning in 1941, the day that will live in infamy. But for China, World War II began in 1937. It was occupied in 1937, and that went on until 1945. So for eight years, China fought World War II um, with, you know, as it was occupied by a very cruel army um, and so much of that experience that these children uh, witnessed is recounted here. And what I started to say is that these, these interviews I did were about things where, with, with people who were told as they walked to school, if they were going to school or walked to the market if they had chores, was if you see a dead body on the street, turn the other way. Um, walk the other direction if you can. Because almost every one of them um, it was an everyday experience. And so, um, so I want to maybe give you a sense of some of the other uh, people. I mean, everybody I interviewed, more than 100, everyone had the most wrenching, the most dramatic, um, sometimes humorous, sometimes just about fate, just chance that they had encountered somebody and got a ticket to get away. Um, so let me see who else I wanted to read to you about. So life under war for children. Uh, I ended up with four. Those of you who have read the book, you know, but I had two boys and two girls. Um, the experience of war and occupation and, and flight and migration is different uh, with a gender lens. I wanted to, there was a revolution. There were uh, many political parties in China at the time of varying viewpoints, but there were two main ones. The old regime, the nationalist Guomindang party led by Chiang Kai-shek, um, who was the out, ended up on the losing side of the revolution. And there was the communist party headed up by Mao Zedong. And, and um, so I wanted to give some sense of the politics of it too, and to have one of the, at least one of the families have a nationalist connection because they definitely had to flee. They were the losing side. And um, so there was a political point of view. There was an economic background because 
you know, one of the stereotypes of, sh of Shanghainese, and I had to actually fight this constantly when I was doing the research, was, oh, you want to write a book about those rich Shanghainese? And it's kind of like rich goes with that. And to other Chinese people, they would say, oh, you want to write about those arrogant Shanghainese? <laughs> and, and, and so there's a reason, and I actually go into this um, in the book because just as we know, there are many, many different cuisines from China. There are different cultures in China, different dialects, different attitudes, and one part of the country has a whole different viewpoint of another, not usually very flattering. We have that, we know that within the US as well. But so I, I just wanna say one of the things um, was the Shanghainese who ended up fleeing to Hong Kong as one of the places was a huge culture clash. You know, uh, Southern China, Guangdong province and Hong Kong, which was mainly made up of Cantonese uh, people from Guangdong province, um, they, it was like oil and water. And so the Shanghainese would come, many of them as refugees, even though they didn't want to call themselves refugees, many of them came with nothing. And so uh, there are many stories about that, but I, I asked them, well, what is it that Hong Kong people don't like about these arrogant, know everything Shanghainese and they would say well you know it's like this if a Shanghai person has one dollar they act like they have a hundred dollars a Hong Konger who has a hundred dollars acts like they have one dollar <laughs> and so you know um, so partly you know one thing I wanted to show in this book too is just how much of a difference there was among the Chinese people too so um, on the political end uh, one of the characters, one of the people is Anwa. Her father was the nationalist official. She had only seen her father twice in her life up until she was about eight or nine years old, you know, um, because her father was fighting the, the uh, Japanese occu occupation, the Japanese army. So he was never home, but the thing about it was they were living in Shanghai. And as the family of a nationalist official, in occupied, enemy occupied Shanghai, there was a target on the back of every one of them. If they were discovered, they could be shot and executed on the street or taken to a, um, a prison, a torture uh, camp where they would be um, tortured for any information they had and that they would never be able to, they would never get out alive. That was the reputation they had. So, um, Anwa grew up having to have a, a false name. She was told, told as a small child, you can never, re, never say the name you, you, that you really have. It's gone now. And never, ever, ever say what your father does. You know? And so, um, so here's a little bit about Anwa in uh, war-occupied Shanghai. Anwa's mother had to be especially careful her new job paid her more than her previous one, but it could also be more dangerous, requiring her to make sales visits throughout Shanghai. According to Charlie, Anwa's older brother, that meant Mama had, would have to pass Japanese checkpoints frequently. Although she managed to carefully plot her sales route to bypass most Japanese sentry points, she could not always avoid crossing the Waibaidu Garden Bridge, those of you who have been to Shanghai, that bridge is still there, it's a very famous landmark. Um, and she would have to cross that narrow little bridge where the occupiers had built a uh, gated checkpoint made out of wood, barbed wire, and sandbags. The belligerent and cruel sentries not only demanded to see identification papers, but required all Chinese to bow to them. It didn't matter if a Chinese was rich or poor, old or young, male or female, all had to stop and bow deeply to the Japanese or face their wrath. One evening, the soldiers stopped an old man carrying such a heavy load on his back, he was bent like a beast of burden. The old man displeased the guards by failing to prostrate himself quickly enough. One of the guards loudly cursed the old man, whipping out uh, whipping him with his rifle butt, then stabbing him through the heart with his bayonet and hurling his lifeless body off the steel bridge and into the fitted Suzhou Creek. 
None of the other guards even blinked while the horrified bystanders, bystanders waited their turn in silence, each of them afraid of becoming the next victim. So, um, so Anwar grew up in terror of the uh, occupying army, and one of the things that especially scared her was the fact that these uh, soldiers made random visits. Um, they enlisted other Chinese, like restaurant workers, to report on who came, what they did, what their identifications was, but they, these sentries would, in the middle of the night, stomp through Shanghai, pound on doors, and force people to open them, say who they were, show their papers, and do whatever they wanted to do to them. So um, one day, one day, uh, one night, Anwa was jolted awake by those dreadful footsteps on their quiet boulevard. Not even the leafy trees could muffle the unmistakable sound of the soldiers terrorizing the neighborhood with their random searches. Anwa's worst nightmare was coming true. The Japanese soldiers were making their way up her building. On the first landing, they banged the door, waking the white Russians. These were white Russians, not red Russians. They um, had escaped uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, and there was a whole community and population of white Russians living in Shanghai. So they woke the white Russians living on the first landing and demanded to see their identification papers. Soon, an angry fist banged on the door of Anwa's family home. Open up, open up, show your identity papers, a gruff voice shouted. Mama sent the ama, uh, the nanny, to the door, asking her to stall the soldiers so that she could get dressed. Anwa and her brother huddled together and peeked into the main room. Their mother emerged looking, looking neat and calm, as if she were going to work not to meet angry soldiers. We have nothing of interest to you, she said to the officer in an even unflinching voice. As the brown suited officer stormed into the apartment, he drew his sword and raised the gleaming blade toward Anwa's mother. Show me your ID. She calmly gave them her documents. No need to get excited, please. You'll frighten the children. He looked over the papers as the other soldiers glanced around. Where is your husband? What is his name? Mama gave the phony name and answer she had rehearsed. He's not here. He's with his mistress tonight. The officer snorted. As he moved closer to Anwa's beautiful mother, she stepped back and said firmly, that will be all then. Another soldier pointed his bayonet at her mother, but the officer only grunted and signaled to his men to leave. They stormed out and stomped up the stairs to the next door. Now, that was one of many, many incidents I heard, and Anwa was probably about four, five then, and people have asked me, you know, how can you, as a journalist or writing history, recount um, such detail and even dialogue. And I have to tell you, Anwa told me um, this is what she overheard. This is what she experienced. And I have to say, of course, I wasn't there to record this, um, but this is what she remembered. And if any of us had seen our mother standing there with somebody with a sword and a bayonet pointed at her, even if we were four or five years old, we would probably remember that for a very long time, enough to, to, to recount the detail of that. So that's how I, I those are the kind of stories that, that I had. Um, those were the two girls. One of the boys, Benny, was the son of a trader, a collaborationist. He worked for the Japanese. He worked at a, uh, a torture chamber. He was the head of the torture chamber. Uh, who were in charge of finding people like Anwa's father and Anwa's family. And Benny, as you can imagine, his father was a high-ranking collaborator. He had access to everything they could steal from uh, people who were, uh, had run away or just requisitioning because they had all the power as the occupying force. And Benny lived the high life. His family just had 
every kind of caviar and aged scotch and uh, cigars from Cuba and um, ate off of, of, of fine crystals, had chandeliers, had parties every Sunday night with the uh, social um, cream of the crop of Shanghai, which were all collaborators of, at the time, but also including some of the Japanese occupation force. And so Benny was um, a very happy young guy when all of this was going on. They had everything. He didn't, he didn't question where it came from. He didn't have any idea. But um, we know how that story ended. Uh, his father's uh, trajectory up here took a great nosedive when uh, the Japanese surrendered and the Nationalist Army returned. And so um, Benny's life uh, became quite different after that. And so I, I go through what life was like for the very wealthy uh, Shanghai people, and then what did they do after, after the, uh, uh, the period, you know, um, when World War II ended. Now, there were uh, just like, I don't know, how, how many of you are um, World War II buffs and, you know, uh, whether it's in Europe or anywhere, you, you know, there, there's, of course, a lot of history of what happened in Europe and Germany and people who were accused of being collaborators as well. All of that happened in Shanghai as well. And so, um, so Benny at that point was a teenager in high school. He was the oldest son of five children. His older sister had already gotten married, but he became uh, of six children and he became responsible for the four younger ones. And, um, And I'm looking at the clock. I think I will move on a little more. I, I, I just want to say, you know, the idea of Benny's life um, took a real twist. His father was, you know, thrown in prison. I don't want to do too much spoiler here, but his family basically disintegrated. And, um, and so maybe I'll just move on a little bit to the idea of exodus. So World War II ends, eight years of terrible occupation. The, um, U.S. at the time was an ally of China. It's hard to imagine today, but actually, uh, you know, the news about China in those days in America was just how incredible the Chinese people were, how America had to support them. The Chinese were good. Japan was bad, but the Chinese were good. And, uh, and it was an ally. General George Marshall spent a year in Shanghai, trying to broker a truce between the nationalists and the communists. He failed. Um, but, you know, more than 100,000 American GIs who had been stationed in the Pacific during World War II were demobilized in Shanghai. And so what happened in 1945 was the um, British, who had been the sort of the, the ruled the roost of Shanghai, um, Shanghai's foreign concessions at the time, so, you know, they, they, uh, they had the number one berth for the uh, ship to be moored. It was the British yacht that would be there. After that, it was the American Rocky Mount that was there. Um, under British uh, governance in Shanghai, the cars drove on the other side of the street, the wrong side of the street. And as soon as the Americans came in, um, on January 1st, 1946, so shortly after the uh, armistice, uh, the Americans decreed that henceforth all of the uh, cars would drive on, and carts and, and animal, you know, animal pulled carts and human pulled carts would be on the right side of the street. And people predicted that this would be a catastrophe that people, you know, but actually it happened without a hitch. But after that, uh, America's presence in Shanghai was, um, was tremendous. And really every space, every um, storefront, maybe it was a grocery store, it became a bar um, <laughs> or a brothel because there were all of these um, soldiers on R&R &R and uh, getting ready to be shipped back home. So China and Shanghai never actually experienced a moment of peace even though the, um, uh, Japan lost the war, China was on the winning side, but the minute, even before the, the uh, 
signatures on the surrender documents were uh, dry. The civil war, the simmering civil war between the communists and the nationalists burst forward again. Um, there are some things that surprised me about the history here, which was that um, America and Chiang Kai-shek of the nationalists were so worried that the communists would be able to advance after the surrender of Japan that they actually kept the Japanese soldiers there to keep the peace. So they were still marauding around Shanghai as the peace officers, even though they were the enemy. Now it was America and the Nationalist Army that said, no, you stay here. Um, and even throughout other parts of China, the active fighting was still going on, but this time between Japanese soldiers and communists. So there were um, a lot of uh, sort of interesting things that I learned about that period. But so the Civil War goes on. 1945, the war ends. 1946, the Americans are there. Uh, throughout 1946, everybody starts realizing that the um, nationalist government is not going to be able to rule China. It's uh, too corrupt. All of the um, aid, foreign aid that would come into China, whether through the United Nations or um, human rights relief or from the USA, ended up in storage houses uh, owned by members of the Chang family or friends or people who were speculators who would then take this food or medical supplies or anything like that and put it on the black market where they sold it for huge amounts of money, made you know untold millions of dollars. And people knew and they were angry. And what that did to people living in Shanghai that I kind of, I recount in here is that um, inflation just went through the roof. So there are stories and I, I, I tried to make it on a human level and not talk about it in terms of you know economic terms, but where people would say 100 yuan in 1940 would buy a pig. The next year, it would buy a chicken. By the end of the war, it would buy an egg, that 100 yuan. By the time the 1946-1947 the period was happening, it wouldn't even buy a book of matches. And so um, people would say, we, we, we used to go to the market with a, 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 a handful of money and a basket of food. Now we go to the market with a barrel, a wheelbarrow full of money and come back with a handful of food. And so the, the question of how can we live under this government was happening. How can this government rule? And uh, meanwhile, the communists are on the march. So what happened? People saw the handwriting on the wall. They could see this um, juggernaut coming. Um, they had lived under mainly uh, um, either Japanese propaganda for eight years or, or nationalist propaganda that said communists are terrible. They will, you know, they'll kill you. They, they will uh, uh, separate families. They'll take all your property. They, you know, ruin your lives. So people didn't actually know that much about, nobody knew a real communist. Uh, who would admit they were, because anybody who was a leftist, a communist, a trade unionist um, in Shanghai was subject to being arrested, tortured, or executed on the street, which happened on a regular basis. So, um, so people could see, though, the news was that by 1947, 1948, the economy was falling apart and the exodus was beginning. So what happened? I mean, it, it's, it's like um, Jeff was talking about Hong Kong. Um, there's a hard stop there in Hong Kong, you know, in, in, in 23 years. Um, that's going back to China. People have time to think about this. People had time in Shanghai. This was a highly, relative to the rest of China, a pretty educated city. It was the most westernized city. There were many people in the middle class who had sent their kids to school whose kids spoke English. English was actually taught in schools at the elementary level. And they're looking at this thing coming and they're like, what do we do? There, so there are newspaper articles that I found of that time uh, saying the only topic of conversation in Shanghai now is are you staying or are you fleeing? And if you're fleeing, where are you going? And so this, People had a long time to be looking at this army approaching from the northeast 
to the um, Yangtze River, where uh, you know Shanghai is situated near, and and that was it. So in this book, the characters, the people talk about you know it recounts the conversations they had in your family in their families, and if you could put yourself in in that place where you could see. You don't know when, but something terrible is going to happen. Um, what would it take to make you leave? And so, so the people who actually had the most resources at first, they weren't sure whether the communists were going to win, but they were going to hedge their bets. They had enough capital. They had enough resources. Uh, some of those industrialists of Shanghai moved um, some of their assets, some of their factory equipment, maybe their uh, top foreman of their textile mill to Hong Kong or to Taiwan. And they moved their number one son, one of their top assets. So they began, or maybe they got an apartment somewhere in another place, just in case. Well, by 1948, the battles continue with this civil war that's broken out throughout China. And the nationalists lost several major um, uh, battles, three very big battles. And then it was just like, the nationalists are going to lose. So by the end of 1948, the dam is broken. People are just rushing out anywhere. The news is all about um, um, people rushing the docks of ships, trying to get out, uh, fire hoses being aimed at people so that they'll get away from the boats. and. Um, and then it wasn't even a matter of how much money you had. It was a matter of who you knew. Because even all the money in the world might not get you a ticket on that plane, boat, or train. So there were stories after some of these um, ships were so overladen that they actually sank. And there were major stories of, um, in, in fact, the worst maritime disaster in history uh, took place as part of this exodus. More than 2,000 people died. Uh, that's twice as many that died in the, on the Titanic. And so there were several ships that sank uh, like that. And in many cases, they carried the, you know, the, the, the uh, most well-to-do people of Shanghai, not all wealthy, but um, middle-class people who were able to get a ticket and flee. So I thought I would um, read a little passage about Benny and uh, what happened, what sort of continued to happen to him as he tried to make his way as the son of a traitor. And all of his friends from his school, he managed to continue going to school. And his friends are saying, you know, your father's a traitor. Your family has no chance of surviving. Benny, you're our friend. We can get you a ticket. And, he's, and he said, well, no, I don't even have a diploma. If I leave, I have no money, you know, my, my family now is destitute, and I'll just end up like a, a, every other refugee. I have to stay and stay in Shanghai and get my college diploma because that is the only asset I have. So he gets a ticket, but he decides he's not going to use it. What does he do? He says, I'll give it to my younger sister. He had another sister who was in Hong Kong. He wanted to get his sister out of the path of the communists. Um, Benny didn't have much time to persuade Doreen, his sister, to leave. We have no good family connections here in Shanghai. We have no Guanxi uh, influence for your future. In Hong Kong, you won't have to marry a communist. When things settle down in Shanghai, you can always come back. Eventually, he convinced her. On the morning of Doreen's departure, Benny helped her pack. Along with her clothes and identification papers, she took the last of Benny's cash and a few small pieces of gold jewelry from before their father's arrest. It all fit into a small bag. She tucked the ticket into her pocket. When Benny and Doreen arrived at the Shanghai North Railway Station, a place that still exists, she was stunned to f they were stunned to find their mother waiting for them. There she was, her features as fine as ever, looking elegant in her high heels and high necked silk chi pao. Somehow she had learned that Doreen was leaving. She pleaded with her daughter to stay. Come live with me in Suzhou, she begged. 
If you go, we'll never see each other again. Benny hadn't seen his mother since the day, and since the, what, some day earlier, I won't go into that, but um, um, he didn't believe that she really cared about Doreen, not after she had abandoned them all. He figured he just, she just needed Doreen to help her out. He had to counter her entreaties, or else his sister might waver. You're young, you have a chance to have a life, take it. The train was boarding at the platform. Before Doreen could get on, she had to present her exit permit to the communist customs inspectors and submit to their questions. On the platform, she went into their red house, nicknamed for its color as well as for the new regime's politics. Benny and his mother waited in uncomfortable silence. Inside, a scornful inspector rummaged through Doreen's bag, zealously searching for contraband. As he dug through his, her things, he pontificated, saying that anyone wanting to leave the New People's Republic must be a counter-revolutionary. The inspector found her gold jewelry and accused uh, her of hiding it for illicit purposes. The officer took all her possession, possessions and pushed her out of the Red House. She ran running to Benny in tears, relaying that the inspectors had taken everything. As Doreen stood crying, the train engineer tooted the horn and the conductors announced last call to come aboard. Benny shouted a single question, where is your train ticket? Suddenly Doreen remembered and reached down to her hip. It's in my pocket. That's good enough, Benny replied. Um, almost carrying her to the departing train. As Benny hustled his sister toward the car door, his mother clung to the girl's arms, imploring her to stay, pleading that she needed Doreen to help care for her when she was old. No, you mustn't leave. I'll never see you again, she screamed, digging her high heels into the platform. Benny was stronger. He managed to push his sister onto the train just as it began to pull away. From the open door, Doreen called out to him, I have no money, no clothes, nothing. What should I do? The train was going to Guangzhou, and Benny shouted, go to the YWCA in Guangzhou. Um, he worked um, with different Christian organizations, and so he said, I'll let them know you're coming. Doreen stared back in silence, her eyes wide in disbelief as Benny waved goodbye. I'll never see you again, his mother wailed. And so Benny watched his sister's ashen, tear-streamed tear face watching as she pulled away. So that was one of many, many Exodus stories that were kind of like that, you know, um, people wondering where they would go, um, leaving behind many things. And so I, I guess as we um, approach the time that I want to open it up to all of you to ask your questions, I, I um, wanted to share some of the things that I learned in the course of, of, of writing this book about this generation of people who fled, you know, the hundred and some that I interviewed and the many more that I tried to learn about. and. You know, one of the things I said, you know, what would it take for any of us to leave, to get to this point, to, to leave everything? And um, I had long conversations with people about what they were thinking about. And so today we're at a point where, you know, there are uh, estimated 43 million refugees, not just migrants, but refugees who are fleeing. Just yesterday there was a, um, a news report that a million people in Syria are fleeing, you know, a million refugees. That's just from one hotspot. We know that not far from here at our southern border, you know, that um, the migrants from Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, they've been reviled as criminals, all of them, you know, uh, and you would al only imagine that they said, oh, let's go to America to destroy it, and let's bring the kids too. And in <laughs> fact, you know, the, the, the kind of debates that went on in the 1947, 1948, 1949, and so forth, people agonized over where should we go. If we only have five tickets, 
Who do we bring? Who do we leave behind? There were many stories that I heard from people who said, um, uh, one woman told me my mother never forgave my father because there were some babies. And my father said, leaving will be too hard for the children, the youngest children. Let's leave them behind. We'll be back in six months. You know, this, the, this communist army can't possibly govern China. They'll only be in power for a short period of time. Let's leave them behind. Well, this woman's mother never saw those children again. And, and so, as, as Lily told me, she said my mother never forgave my father for that decision. But that was just one of so many other families who had to decide the same thing. And um, so, when, we, when I hear stories about the migrants and refugees today, every one of them has gone through some kind of calculus like that. I mean, you don't just say, let's pack up the kids and walk a thousand miles. How many diapers do we need to bring? Where are we going to get food and milk? And what's going to happen when we reach the border, when we know our children might be ripped from our arms and put into a cage and we might never see them again? Well, the only thing that moves people to do that is if they think those children are not going to survive childhood. And so they're willing to, res to um, risk that. And that's what these Shanghai people did. They also have a very good sense of laws, what's going on, geography. The Shanghai um, uh, exiles and migrants, they, they analyze the, the world. Should we go to Brazil? Brazil is welcoming. Well, they're welcoming a lot of um, World War II uh, war criminals, but they're also welcoming people from China. Maybe we could make a life there. Um, what about Europe? Forget Europe. Europe is still recovering from um, you know, World War II, so some did go to Europe, but uh, relatively few. Hong Kong, we can cross the border there. That won't be so difficult. You know, get there by train, like uh, Doreen just did. Uh, what about Taiwan? Um, that's too close. People would make decisions and send of their four children, one of them each to another country if they could. And they would say, at, at least one member of our family might survive. So these were things that people really thought through. And I think the migrants of today, wherever they're from, whether it's from the Sudan and deciding to put your children who can't swim, and you can't swim either, into the Mediterranean seas, um, they're making a calculation on where to go that's based on a lot of information, as much as they can get. And the other thing is refugees, no matter where they go, they're not welcome. Um, they're not. You know, and so the kind of uh, rhetoric and political debate that we hear today, that was happening. That was happening um, throughout the world as this exodus was going on with the Shanghai um, people as well. And so let me see. I, there are, uh, there's a lot more to say about that, and I guess I want to um, leave, wait for you to ask me. but. When people flee and they leave almost everything behind and risk everything and they're given a chance at life and safety somewhere, unlike this notion that they are going to be you know, hell-bent on destroying that safe haven, in fact, they actually become the model citizens if they are allowed to become citizens. And I, and I want to just give you a small list of a random list almost of some of the children of these um, Shanghai migrants. They include um, the first chief executive of uh, Hong Kong, Tung Chi Hua, who became a, a, a quite a wealthy industrialist. U.S. cabinet members Elaine Chow, and, uh, um, who is now uh, Secretary of Transportation. Um, Nobel Award winner uh, Stephen Chu, who was Secretary of Energy under President Obama. They include ambassadors, um, uh, architects like Maya Lin, uh, Tony Award winning playwrights like David Henry Huang and uh, Ming Cho Lee, filmmakers like Ang Lee, the uh, Oscar winner, and Janet Yang, who produced um, uh, uh, Joy Luck Club and many other films today. 
uh, authors Iris Chang, Gish Jen, who has a new book that's just come out, Gus Lee, Betty Bow Lord, um, Lynn Pan, Amy Tan, uh, Sean Wong, it's a, a number of advocates, people who are uh, prominent civil rights uh, advocates. Um, and the list just goes on and on, many journalists. And so um, this was more or less a random list that I, I put together. And people might say, well, they're the model minority. They're the children of the Chinese. They had um, tiger parents, you know, those Shanghai people. But in fact, what uh, social scientists prove over and over again, it's really the children of immigrants. And so immigrants from wherever in the world, like Colin Powell or Edwidge Dandicat or um, Carlos Santana or, you know, that list is huge. But so the thing about it is, uh, my point, wherever it is they go, they are going to try to make it the safest place for those children that they manage to get over the high seas or walk a thousand miles with. And those kids know the sacrifice that their parents have made. So I want to end with a very brief read because I know a lot of this is pretty heavy stuff. And not all of it in the book is because it's about real people's lives. So my fourth um, um, main uh, character was named Ho, Ho Chow. And he was a student. And so the majority of people in any part of the world, they actually kind of just want to live life and not get involved, whether it's communist or nationalist. And Ho's family told him, just don't get involved. Do not get involved in politics. Stay away. We will map out your route to school so that you can avoid anything that might be troublesome to you. And Ho took his family's um, you know, admonitions to heart. He studied very hard and became one of the top uh, engineers of China. And that earned him a visa. It earned him uh, entrance to MIT or the University of Michigan as a graduate student and a visa to go. And it gave his family the right to exchange money into Chinese money into US dollars so that he could pay for his tuition and, um, and all of that. So one of the things about Ho was he kept a journal in Chinese. He also kept every piece of correspondence that he had from his family who were in Shanghai and then later they had their own exodus. He kept all of those. They were all in Chinese. He was an engineer. He scanned every one of those. He organized them, labeled them, put them on a CD and gave it to me. And so that was a treasure trove. And so I had these documents uh, translated into English. And um, here is from his passage in his journal on the day he left Shanghai to head to the University of Michigan so that he could one day learn how to build cars in China. The American ship offered Ho a a first glimpse into his upcoming life in America. To cool off from the heat of the sticky August day, he took a shower, his first experience with such a contraption. Nearby was a water fountain, another first. After a few cautious sips, he quenched his thirst from this amazing device that dispensed a continuous stream of clean water no boiling necessary. In the third class dining room, he waited in a long but orderly line for servings of sausages, potatoes, carrots, rice, bread, fruits, tea, and sugar, a precious commodity in Shanghai. The unlimited quantities stunned him, especially the sugar. That night, he jotted down a new American phrase, all you can eat. <laughs> so that was Ho's first experience with America, and he continued to document that. And so I wanted to end on that lighter note, because there is a lot to celebrate of what happened to these people. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Meg and to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we have a few minutes for questions. And what we'd like to do, instead of using the mic tonight, if you could stand up and speak loudly, um, that would be great. So I'll let you pick. Oh, oh yeah. Well, here comes somebody. I'm sorry? Oh, of course, the flying tigers. Um, I couldn't cover every aspect of the war. Uh, you know, that would have been too encompassing in this book, but they are mentioned here. They are mentioned. Um, the flying tigers, how many of you know about the flying tigers? And many of you, well, they were quite a, 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 a glorious and, and uh, um, famous group of Americans who, and it also included a number of Chinese pilots who were trained by the Americans to uh, fight in the interior and to have, um, you know, pretty much dog fights with Japanese um, uh, pilots. You did. I'm sorry, could you say that again? And when was that? So in the 60s, you met a number of the Flying Tigers who, in the 60s, and, and I'm happy to say there are actually a number of museums, you know, uh, both in China as well as in the United States that, that um, celebrate the Flying Tigers and, and, and how special that you were able to meet them. Um, so there's a lot, a lot that I wasn't able to cover, but they do get a little bit of a mention. Thank you. A guest who's a neighbor of mine. We just recently met, and his family did leave China when he was a child and went to Taiwan. Ah. So he's my special guest. Well, thank to you. Meet thank Helen. you. Thank you. So you're part of this exodus. Uh, I'd have back surgery, so I'm not going to stand up. Sure. Uh, talking about the uh, flying tigers. When I was a kid, I, mean, I was in Kunming, mm -hmm. and. Uh, when the Japanese formation bombers come in, I was able to watch a, a long uh, flying tiger P-40 flying straight up, shoot him, and flying down, shoot him, and finally he got shot, and a, a parachute will come. I saw I was a kid, you know, <laughs> just awed with what's going on. Mm -hmm. So the. The flying tigers were, were, were a savior, savior for us because the Japanese bomber came in. They were bombing us at, at, with impunity. We had no air defense until the fly, flying tigers came in. And then the, the, the bombing, the, a savage bombing, uh, sort of stopped from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, there is, while I didn't go into specifically a lot about the Flying Tigers, um, one of the characters, Anwa, you know, I said her father was a nationalist official. He actually went inland, not as far as Kunming, but in that area. So many of the nationalist government um, forces actually fled the coast. Uh, the capital was in Nanjing at the time, and many of them were in the Shanghai region. And um, something like 30 million, I think, uh, I think that's the figure I know, 30 million Chinese went inland to set up a free China area. Um, but of course, Japan with its planes also followed them. And it was like routine clockwork. So Chongqing, if any of you have been to Chongqing, is, is, uh, became the wartime capital. And so in Anwa's story uh, of the time that they moved inland, um, before they went back to Shanghai and the passages that I read, um, many accounts of people were how they could look up. These were, um, even though they were airplane uh, bombers, they would have gunners with machine guns and they would fly so, cl so close to the surface of you know, the ground that the people on the ground could actually see their faces and could see that they were gunning for them. And, uh, and so, so this, this war was very terrible, and whether it was the Flying Tigers or your experience in, in Kunming, uh, Japan had a wartime policy that was the three alls. Um, burn all, loot all, kill all. And, and the idea of blitzkriegs that, uh, that we know of from Nazi Germany, Japan actually started that in the uh, war with China, where um, 
they would terrorize a civilian population and try to, to burn all, kill all, loot all, including with airplanes. Um, so thank you for sharing that. So there are a bunch of hands over on this side. Would you like to start? A little bit about your mother's like hesitation or um, it took her many years before she could tell her story. And I'd love to hear more, but it took her many years before she felt comfortable telling her story. And I'd love to hear more about um, other people's reactions, the people you're interviewing, about like whether it took time for them to be feel comfortable um, or to process their trauma, to tell their story. And if the conversations you had while doing research for this book inspired, like, sorry, I'm getting emotional, but like intergenerational sure. conversations as well. So. Well, thank you for your question. Um, so the experience I had in, with my mother keeping this secret or not telling us anything for so many years, I just found repeated over and over again. You know, um, and on reflection, I have to say, you know, we're, we're talking about people who from a very young age really experience great trauma. And whether that was in China or in Europe or anywhere that war is, takes place, there's a lot that people see that they would maybe prefer not to talk about for a long time. And I interviewed people, as I said, in, who were the average age was 80. Sometimes I'd be hearing stories that were just so emotional. Um, and, I would, or, or, and they were all extraordinary. And I would just stop and say, do your children, who would be grown children, do they know what you just told me? And more often than not, the answer would be, no, I don't think they're interested, or N no, they don't know. And, um, and I would say, no, I think they really would be interested. I think if you could tell them, and, and then you, you have to imagine, how would that come up to say, oh, by the way, I never told you this, but I witnessed such horrible things when I was a child. And, and it doesn't happen that way. And, and so I was in a, in a, in a what I thought was an incredibly privileged position to be told these things sometimes that they did not even tell the people closest to them. And, and I, I also think there's a time when people feel ready to tell those stories. I think, uh, you know, when it's too fresh, it's too painful. They're not going to talk about them. I mean, we know from Holocaust survivors, there are so many stories of people whose um, grandparents or parents never told them and they didn't find out until much later that they had a, a, a whole family who had experienced that. Or um, yesterday was the day of remembrance of the internment of Japanese Americans. That is a common thread among the third generation and fourth generation of, of Japanese Americans, you know, right here in California who say that they never knew uh, the, their, par their grandparents and parents never talked about it. Even their, grand, their parents didn't know because their, their, their parents wouldn't talk about it. It was just too hard. And so, um, so there's a part of it that involves just trying to reclaim that, to find the right time to ask people um, these questions, to find the right way to ask questions. I mean, um, uh, there were times when I asked questions I realized in my interview I asked that too directly um, with Benny. The first time I met Benny, I already knew something about his background. I knew, his father is a, is a historic figure. He's in a lot of textbooks and books about uh, that period of Shanghai. And so I knew that about him. And, I, and the first time I met him, I said, well, you know, your father was a, um, considered a traitor. Um, how was that for your family? <laughs> Benny didn't say anything. He gulped. I, thought his face turned a little ashen when I asked that question. And I, I immediately knew that this was not the time. He, you know, I shouldn't have asked him that question. But he was generous, generous enough that he allowed me to come back. He didn't kick me out of his apartment. And um, I came back. And, 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 and because I worked on this book for a period of 12 years, um, I interviewed these four main um, people uh, repeatedly over a period of 10 years. So I would say it was probably about year six or seven that I was able to sort of revisit that with Benny and, and, and ask him. 
So what was it like when you visited your father in prison? What would you talk about? Um, how did you feel about your father? And this time he was so generous and he said, um, he was my father. I loved my father, but I hated my father too. I hated how his choices destroyed our family. And I hated how his choices um, so damaged the Chinese people. So, you know, the stories about his mother, the story about the train and his mother, you know, he, dragging his sister and his mother to the train, those things came later. And I've talked to a lot of people who have said, you know, my family has secrets too, and what family doesn't, right? Um, but I can never get anybody to talk about them. Uh, there are a couple of suggestions I have. One is um, maybe change the way you ask the question, or um, instead of saying, did this happen to you? Um, if they're Chinese and went through this experience and you know about some of these characters, you could say, you know, I, I read this book or I heard this thing happen to somebody. Do you know anybody that this might have happened to? So it's a much less direct question. They might be able to answer it in another way. And here's another tip. If they won't talk to the, their adult children about it, if there are grandchildren involved, put the grandchildren on them. Um, that's a much safer interview for them to, to have or questions and so many of the grandparents are willing to tell the grandchildren or a stranger like me anything whereas with parent to child no matter how old the parent and the child you know how, how old they are um, there's a lot of dynamic right and so a lot of parents or kids don't, just don't want to hear that story from mom and dad. It's just too, too full of, of their morals and their messages and, and whatever. So um, there's, but that's the importance of capturing these um, intergenerational stories, as you said, because, you know, if we don't learn from history and we don't learn our own history that can lead us to have some compassion for other people, um, how do we stop repeating history? So um, for you as somebody younger than me, you know, I would just say, please, if you have uh, stories that you want to, you know, things, questions you have, keep at it. I was 50 when my mother told me this, in my 50s when my mother told me. There were some other hands over here. We're going to have to wrap up. We're running. I think we could be here all evening. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we also want to give Helen a little break and thank her for being here and also give you guys a chance to buy her book and get it signed. So yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And those of you who weren't able to ask me a question, you know, I'll be here. Please you feel free to come up. I'm happy to talk with you after, too. Thank you all. Great questions. Great audience. Thank you.